coming up on today's Wild West. We'll ride the trails of a California ranch founded in the 1860s. We'll saddle up with the Cowboy Lawyers Association. Oh God, I love the Cowboy Lawyers. Take a trail ride down Colorado Boulevard for the Pasadena Rose Parade. And meet some of the best American Indian artists in the country. Today's Wild West, up next. The Wild West. It's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. Early morning at California's Rankin Ranch. And here come the horses. Quite a sight to watch them run as they're driven in from their overnight pasture. It's a morning routine that's been repeated in one form or another ever since 1863 when Walker Rankin founded this 31,000 acre cattle ranch here at the southern end of the Sierra Nevada mountains. But this morning is not entirely routine. Inside the corral, something has the horses spooked. Turns out a stray calf that wandered into a nearby barn has the horses all worked up. It's out of the ordinary for them. Usually when they're in the corral, it's nice and quiet and calm, not a whole lot going on, so. Not today. Nope. <laughs> the boys, as they're known, soon settle down. Morning chores of brushing and saddling get underway. Snoopy's a character. <laughs> Who's that? Snoopy, this one right here. He's, oh, yeah? He's got a lot of personality. How so? Huh. How do you mean? He's, uh, well, he's got a mind of his own for sure, but he kind of lets you know when you get on him yeah. <laughs> what he's thinking. Okay. And... Lots of work to get these horses ready for the day, but for Tara Rankin, it's a labor of love. The horses always put you in a good mood. When you see them coming in in the morning, they make you happy. Tara is married to Jason Rankin, Walker Rankin's great-great-grandson. Walker was 22 when he left Pennsylvania to look for gold in California. He found it too, and he may have been searching for more when he came across this mountain bowl known as Walker Basin, named for an early trapper. Lavinia Estelle Leitner's family took a wagon train from Missouri for the California gold rush. Her dad found gold too, and also settled in Walker Basin. In 1868, Walker Rankin married the girl next door, and the couple started the family that's lived here ever since. You look at that mountain right there, yeah. and you realize that your great-grandfather, he looked at that same mountain, and your grandfather and your father, and they all sweated blood right here. But you have to also think about the other people that have worked on this ranch, and their part that has kept this mountain and, and this ranch alive. Like the recently retired Juan Romero, who worked on the ranch for nearly 50 years. And the stage line from Los Angeles came through this area because of the gold that was discovered over in Keysville. The original Rankin home, built in the 1870s and beautifully preserved, is something like a family museum. It's fascinating to see the old pictures, the antique firearms, and hear the old stories. And Lavinia cooked meals for the travelers, and occasionally they would stay over, not, not too often, but occasionally they would. The barn where the stagecoach pulled in to change horses still stands. A wagon wheel, a reminder of the many travelers who came through all those years ago, and still do. Well, another beautiful day at Rankin Ranch, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Always. Always a beautiful day at Rankin Ranch. Always. Rankin Ranch is celebrating 50 years of welcoming visitors after adding a guest ranch to its cattle operation back in 1965. It was Bill's mother's idea. And if I can graze cattle on it, and I can get somebody to pay me to take them on a horseback ride across it, I ought to come out. People from all over the world are glad she did. We should definitely come back next year. <laughs> we'll take you for a trail ride on Rankin Ranch and show you what makes a visit here so special when we come back. Trail riding at Rankin Ranch. It's a highlight of a stay at this historic working cattle and guest ranch, but for many returning guests, the unwinding begins before they even get out of the car. And as we clear the corner and you see it, and you see the basin, it feels like we're home. We have a lot of our guests who will say that they feel like they're coming home to grandma's house. They're coming home, that when they get to the top of the mountain here and they look out and see the valley, there's just a sense of peace. 
That peace won't be interrupted by cell phones, which don't work at the ranch, and it's enhanced by a warm and friendly atmosphere that welcomes guests as if they're part of the family. And it makes you feel like you're just a, a long lost cousin that came for the weekend. <laughs> That's how I feel. When Beth Sellers first started coming 10 years ago, it'd been a long time since she sat on a horse, but it didn't take long to get comfortable. My first day on the horses when I saw how healthy, how well trained and behaved, how good their staff, Wrangler staff was. They made sure you were safe, yet you still had a good time and were challenged. Um, yep, I was bitten by the bug. <laughs> Walker wants to ride that one. Guest rides are actually a second career for the horses in the rank and ranch string. Their younger years are spent as mounts for the cowboys of this 31,000 acre working cattle ranch. The mountainous terrain at the southern end of the Sierra is not the easiest country on horses, but by the time they're ready for the less strenuous life of the dude string, the animals are well prepared. And that makes some of the best guest horses because the cowboy horses have been everywhere, they've seen everything. They're not going to get scared at a bird flying out of a bush because they've seen that plenty. While guests don't ever work the cattle, they do get to see the cowboys in action and ride the same trails. No ATVs on this place. All the work is done horseback, and that gives guests an appreciation for what it takes for both horse and rider to work this country. Plus, the scenery is simply spectacular. You just don't ride like this in, uh, in the UK, so it's, it's a totally different way of riding. It's really, it's really good. I mean, it's very therapeutic as well, really therapeutic. It's just like really beautiful, isn't it? We were sitting out outside our cabin earlier, and it was just so beautiful. I think probably they'll go away with a different opinion of the cattle business, hopefully. You know, they might find that we're not such bad people after all. Don't, don't try and trade me your husband for your, <laughs> yeah. for your horse, you know, because it isn't, isn't going to happen. <laughs> a relaxing horseback visit to Rankin Ranch can also be an educational one. The Rankins consider themselves ambassadors for the livestock industry, and are happy to explain their sometimes misunderstood business to their largely urban clientele. I like talking to them and telling them what our side of the story is. Our side is not always told correctly. Just like the only airline flight you ever hear about is the one that crashes, Bill says the only rancher that ever makes the news is the 1% that gives the business a bad name. Some rancher that's abusing things, he's the one that gets written up and talked about. The other 99%, they never get talked about. Bill Rankin says cattle ranching is really grass farming. You know, the good Lord grows grass on these mountains every year. And the grass on these mountains is no different than a crop of wheat down in the valley to, to a farmer. And so we take a natural renewable resource of grass and we turn it into a nutrient dense food product. Even the youngest visitors to Rankin Ranch can get a hands-on introduction to agriculture at the children's petting zoo. Kids can bottle feed the sheep, brush the donkey, and meet Bill's granddaughter, Josie, and her beloved chicken, Goldie. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. And now you can go home with a tasty souvenir of your visit, Rankin Ranch Beef. Amanda is spearheading a new effort to directly market the beef raised here. Her brother raises hay, and her sister has started a beekeeping business. You have to let the younger generation do a thing or two, you sure. know? You can't just sit on them until you die. Right. The diversification is just part of the challenge of keeping this sixth generation family business thriving in an ever-changing world. You know, this ranching deal, it's kind of it's like playing chess with three opponents. You know, you kind of have uh, Mother Nature, you have the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and you have the U.S. government. Now, out of the three, Mother Nature is the meanest of the bunch because she never tips her hand. You know, it depends on the day. <laughs> Some days it does seem like a little bit of a daunting task because there's a lot that goes into running a ranch and obviously some days are more challenging than others no matter what you do. But I think that it's, it's something that we all embrace and really appreciate the opportunity to be able to live on the ranch and raise our families on the ranch and keep things going. So while it is daunting at times. It's also very exciting at the prospect of being able to keep it going for another 150 years. Guests who come year after year to escape to this timeless refuge are counting on that. You know, I'm married. <laughs> but they can rest easy. 
The entire Rankin family is unified in their determined purpose to preserve this place and its precious way of life they so generously share with people from all over the world. I can't think of a better thing to do in a person's life than to preserve this mountain and uh, keep it like it was 150 years ago. Cowboy lawyers forever! <laughs> they spend their week in the courtroom and weekends horseback. Up next, Cowboy Lawyers Association. We're going to ride right to the top of the park. It's a beautiful morning here in Griffith Park. A 4,000 acre oasis of urban wilderness in the heart of Los Angeles with 55 miles of horse trails. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? A group of riders you might not expect to find in the saddle are about to set out for a two hour ride. These cowboys and cowgirls are actually judges and lawyers and members of the Cowboy Lawyers Association. Cowboy lawyers forever. <laughs> Oh, God, I love the cowboy lawyers. The Civil attorney Dee Arnell has been a member of the group for 16 years. I haven't missed hardly a ride since then. Today's trek will take about three dozen riders up through LA's Hollywood Hills to Mount Hollywood, site of the world famous Hollywood sign. While you do have to be a judge or an attorney to join this group, you don't have to be a great equestrian or even own a horse to participate in the rides. We have a stock contract with a local uh, stock contractor who provides horses. Today on our ride, for example, he trailered down 23 horses for our riders. Many members of the group do own their own horses, like co-founder Jim Nichols, here on his beautiful buckskin quarter horse, Montana. I've seen horses go over the side and I had a horse fall off the trail one time with me. It was high enough. Cowboy Jim, as the attorney is known, got the idea for the group during a settlement conference with an LA Superior Court judge back in 1989. And we're sitting there and we're talking about the case and I noticed under the glass top on his desk, he had a picture of him in shaps on top of a mule. So I said, uh, you know, judge, are you a writer? And he says, yes, I am. He says, are you? Today, there are more than 260 members of the Cowboy Lawyers, a group that shares a love for horseback riding, the American West, and all that it stands for. Self-reliant, friendly, um, cooperative and uh, not relying on the government too much. And I think it's very American. I think it's very positive. I think when you think of cowboys, I mean, how can you not like cowboys? I mean, that's who we are. Surprising how many lawyers uh, are fascinated by the West, are fascinated by personalities uh, of Western U.S. history. Lawmen were, of course, a big part of the Old West. Men like Marshall Wyatt Earp, Judge Roy Bean, and Wild Bill Hickok, who served as both a marshal and a sheriff. Fascinating stuff to talk about along the trail. The only thing you're not allowed to discuss is work. Shop talk is forbidden. Besides, a cowboy lawyer ride, whether for a day or an entire weekend, is all about getting away from work. See the Greek theater right there on the, over the edge? It's just the best thing to be able to come and be out in the wilderness and smell the horses and relax and the sun. Cowboy Lawyers is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's a great group of friends. It's uh, a lifetime of activity on horses with, with people that I like. I can't think of anything better. The Cowboy Lawyers Association does about half a dozen rides a year, including a couple of overnights, like this beautiful fall weekend ride on the V6 Ranch. Well, first of all, we we're blessed with just absolutely beautiful piece of property. Located 200 miles north of L.A., the V6 Ranch is 20,000 acres of beautiful, unspoiled Central California with a unique guest operation, welcoming both horse owners and keeping a string of well-trained rental horses for everyone else, from beginners to experts. A big part of our business is groups just like cowboy lawyers here that uh, bring their own horses and ride on a regular basis, but want to have a chance to come and ride the, on the ranch here on the V6. And uh, what we do here that most places can't do is we're also cattle operation, so we can do all the things we normally do with the cattle. Cattle work would come tomorrow. This day would be spent on the trail, soaking in the scenery of this magnificent place. Everywhere you can see is a V6, huh? That's correct. No better antidote to a high stress job and saddling up with a group of friends who love to ride. I love the people, I love the horses, the scenery, everything's beautiful. Lots of fun to hang out with these men and women, and they'd love to have more members. If you are a lawyer and you, and you do want to ride horses and you want to have a lot of fun and you're fun to be with, 
you know, give us a call and, and join up because we'd love to have you. But what if you're not a lawyer in Southern California? Well, why not start your own crew? There are people in every walk of life who love to ride and love the West. You can start up the cowboy contractors, cowgirl beauticians, or the cowboy insurance agents. It's all about getting together on horseback in some nice country to enjoy a day of the Western lifestyle, or perhaps an entire weekend at the V6 Ranch. It's five o'clock in the morning on New Year's Day. We're at the staging area for the 2016 Rose Parade. We'll show you all the preparations it takes to get these guys ready for the big event coming up on today's Wild West. It's January 1st in Pasadena, California. As the flyover by the B-2 Stealth Bomber kicks off the Rose Parade. Every year since 1890, Pasadena has celebrated the new year with this grand parade down Colorado Boulevard. And horses, all kinds of horses, have always been part of the celebration. There's the U.S. Marine Corps Mounted Color Guard, the Spirit of the West Riders, the Martinez family, Medieval Times, the Wells Fargo Stagecoach, and the group I was privileged to ride with, the Long Beach Mounted Police. Quite a thrill to take that long trail ride down Colorado Boulevard and it's quite a journey to get ready for this great event. The day before, the horses are getting all shined up for their big day at the Los Angeles Equestrian Center. The center serves as home base for the out-of-town horse groups that ride in the parade. Equestrian units from all over the country apply to take part in this prestigious event, and it's a great honor to be chosen. It's an amazing privilege, really amazing. It's fascinating to learn about the equestrians taking part. And this is a purebred Arabian. She's from the Rush Creek Ranch in Nebraska. Like the American Endurance Riding Conference, here for their very first Rose Parade. It's kind of like I, the equivalent of marathon running. So instead of short distance, we're racing over 50 miles, sometimes 100. Noise, crowds, and floats in the parade would spook and terrify an ordinary horse, so the animals have to be conditioned or bomb-proof to handle all the excitement. We've been working on just exposing them to different variables, uh, uh, different noises, taking them out by the freeway, and just working with them. And, and they've been trained to know that we're a teammate, and so they'll look to us for security. So when we're in the parade, we'll be their best friend because we'll be telling them it's okay. okay. And they'll react to that. Many of the horse groups have been here before. Tommy Harris is here for his third Rose Parade. Every year is a new year. A lot of fun. Well, I've seen it a couple times on TV, but never thought I'd actually be in it. Or Specialist Reagan Kirvin is with the U.S. Army's Fort Sill Field Artillery Half Section, a U.S. Army horse-drawn historical unit that appears in parades and ceremonies. It's a pretty good gig in the Army. I've always had a dream of working with horses in some kind of capacity for an actual job, and now I'm living that dream. Reagan's favorite breed is the Clydesdale, and the horses of Budweiser fame are getting their bath too. You know, it's maybe a little noisier and a little louder than some of the parades, but horses handle it real well. This busy day of preparation does not end when the sun goes down. While the rest of the world celebrates New Year's Eve, the equestrians are loading up their horses and heading for the parade staging area. Here we go! Woohoo! Rose Parade! <laughs> a freeway transition road near the parade route is blocked off and becomes a giant overnight parking lot for the trucks and trailers hauling the horses, all supervised and organized by the hundreds of volunteers who make the parade happen, easy to spot in their white suits on their Honda scooters. Wouldn't happen without you guys, would it? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> but it's amazing how it comes together every year. Because everybody down here has got to have a driver. Yes, that would be me. Every rider in the parade needs a personal volunteer as well to get their truck from the staging area to the end of the parade route. When I heard Rose Parade behind the scenes, I thought it would be pretty phenomenal. Riders have to be at the staging area by midnight, where we'll try to catch a few hours sleep. Meantime, not far away, the Rose Parade floats are rolling out of the barns where they've been put together, heading for their staging area. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. We get a front row seat. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs>
It's a great opportunity to get a close-up look at the beautiful roses, seeds, and other organic material used to create each and every fluid. Like this Western-themed float from the great state of South Dakota, featuring a buffalo, horse, and the famous faces of Mount Rushmore. Back on the freeway with the horses, the clock strikes 4 a.m., and the Wells Fargo crew is putting the fingernail polish on the fine horses that will pull their three iconic stagecoaches in this year's parade. Rod Cooper has been driving stagecoaches for 37 years. My grandfather broke uh, driving horses for the coal mines in West Virginia, and I grew up driving horses with him. So that's how I got to driving for Wells Fargo. The parade is now just hours away. And as the riders start getting their horses ready, the excitement is contagious. And whoever would have thought, here we are, from Texas to California, and now we're living the dream. We're riding in the Rose Bowl parade. How cool is that? Very excited. Very excited. Very excited. Yes. Couldn't sleep all night. The Long Beach Mounted Police are up and about and getting ready. And even those who've done this for years are thrilled to be here once again. How many people in the world get to ride in the Rose Parade? And that, as soon as you turn that corner and go on Colorado, it is, it, it brings tears to your eyes. It's so awesome. Riders get their horses warmed up as dawn approaches, and then at last, it's time. That trail ride down Colorado Boulevard is truly like no other. A great thrill, honor, and privilege to be invited to ride with the Long Beach Mounted Police and carry our cherished American flag. Living here in Southern California, riding in the Rose Parade is something I'd always wanted to do. And thanks to my friend Bob Lorbeer, I was invited to ride four Rose Parades with the Long Beach Mounted Police. Living that dream is an experience I will never forget and always remember every New Year's Day. It's, it's amazing. Incredible. From handmade arrows to baskets, jewelry, blankets, and so much more. There's a fascinating story behind every artist at the 25th Annual American Indian Arts Marketplace at the Autry National Center in Los Angeles. It's on brain tan smoked deer hide, inside and out. And I even sign my name in thread. I do all my own hunting and tanning as well. A member of the Ingalik Athabascan tribe, Glenda McKay lives in an Alaskan village so remote, they still have no running water. And we would normally just keep our prized possessions in them. Um, the women would use these, sometimes the men would too. They might even use it as a tobacco box. Her traditional Ingalik basket of seal fur, deer hide, and tiny beads won the top prize at the show, the Jackie Autry Purchase Award and will become part of the Autry Museum's permanent collection. It's very exciting. Glenda is a multi-talented artist. At her booth, you can see her intricately crafted Alaskan doll and unique jewelry. Check out these earrings, made by splitting a fossilized walrus tooth. I try to do everything traditional, the way that it was done from what I was taught. And like many of the native artists here, Glenda is happy to share her story. A lot of people don't understand Alaska culture. And being down here, it's been very helpful in explaining things. Most artists, we all are, especially native art, we're all trying to say something. James Fendenheim transforms the skeletons of old saguaro cactus into wood sculptures that tell the story of his people. That's on top of a mountain, a picture ground, yeah, in the res, near my village, San Pedro. I started weaving when I was 17 years old. It takes Rena Begay about eight months to weave the colorful Navajo rugs her tribe is so well known for. Rena, more comfortable speaking Navajo than English, weaves the blankets at her home on the reservation with a little help from her son, Leroy. Sometimes I'm colorblind, so he has to help me. Which color goes with which color and stuff? In collaborative efforts. Yes. <laughs> Leroy's a talented silversmith, creating bracelets, rings, and a striking bolo tie of turquoise. Royston turquoise, and then uh, the same thing here, and then this one is uh, Marenzi. Nearby, we meet another family of artists, Blackfeet Comanche jewelry designer Jane Myers and her daughter Wakia, who's here displaying her ledger art. We would traditionally do this art on hides, but when we were put onto these reservations, we didn't have access to these hides. 
So we turned to what the general store is discarded, and that would be these ledger books. The 20 year old finds antique ledger books to use as her canvas, like this one dating back to 1896, telling her personal stories, like her love of horses and her dreams of having a family. Each piece is done with my culture behind it, what we would traditionally wear, our outfits, our designs on the cradle boards here. I create art because it's just, it's, it's something that I like to do and I've been beating ever since I was a child. I've been Jane's dazzling talent puts a glittering spin on her cultural heritage, like this beautiful miniature horse mask. I made the original miniature horse mask for the Comanche National Museum. Or this pendant, shaped like a Comanche woman's dress from the Southern Plains. That's the original form, and then this is the inlaid form. So it's dual-sided, which is great. But Jane's art has a deeper purpose as well. One of my missions is to strengthen my community. And by being a part of First People's Fund, that's one thing that we do. We take artwork, we do seminars, you know, we help other artists, show them about marketing and, you know, how they can get out in, into the art world. Forty tribes are represented among these talented artists. Their work is so prized by buyers and collectors, some come from out of state. Jan Hoffman is here from Santa Fe for the third year in a row. Because it's such a good show. It's a show that blends ancient skills with modern technique, tradition with creative new ideas. It's always evolving. It's made by traditional people, perhaps, but it's, it's evolving to, to the contemporary world. And this annual gathering of artists and their fans is also something of a family reunion. Same friends. Yeah, seeing friends, meeting new friends. And I enjoy the people here. I like coming out to LA. It's, uh, it's in the 40s and it snowed in Santa Fe. So it's nice to, this is like my last dose of summer to come out here and be in the sunshine. Yeah, it's great to have people say, uh, I like your stuff. I want to buy it, you know, that, that's always good. <laughs> it happens every November in Los Angeles. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in Today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com.